Hi folks, Mackenzie Lambert here, your host for Mac and the Movies. Today we have a nice selection of films for our topic, the Polizio Teshi films of Enzo G. Castellari. Before we look at the films, let's take a look at the man himself. Born Enzo Girolami on July 29th, 1938, he comes from a family heavily involved in movies. His father and uncle were filmmakers. His brother was an actor. His cousin, Massimo Vanni, would be a prominent stuntman in Italy and appear regularly in Enzo's films. We'll see him quite a bit in this episode. His children have their share of noted credits. His son, Andrea Girolami, would see his biggest credit as the second unit director for The English Patient. His daughter, Stefania, started as an actress in his films, beginning with Sting of the West through Sinbad of the Seven Seas. Much like her brother, she found a lot of work as a second unit director. Credits include cult classic films, Super Mario Brothers, and Empire Records, as well as mainstream TV programs like Dawson's Creek and American Gothic. Enzo would start out as a boxer before he earned a degree in architecture. He started out in film doing various jobs, ranging from second unit directing, stunts, acting, writing, and editing. His first directorial effort, despite being uncredited, was a few dollars for Django. From there, the only direction was upwards. High Crime begins with a Lebanese drug dealer being chased throughout the city of Genoa. When he's finally apprehended by Vice Commissioner Belli, the transport with the dealer explodes, killing the dealer and the cops with him. The precipitous nature of this new menace has Belli concerned enough that he consults with Cafiero, an elderly former gangster who still keeps his ears out from time to time. Cafiero warns Belly that there's a new gang in town. Commissioner Scavino has created a dossier of the various mafia associates in the city, but due to a lack of concrete evidence, he's resistant to go to the district attorney. When he finally does decide to go to the DA, he is swiftly murdered and the dossier stolen from him. This leads to Belly now being the new police commissioner. Unfortunately, the promotion puts a target on Belly and those close to him. Even worse is the new gang may have some connection with high-level politicians. Throughout the 60s and the early 70s, Castellari would dabble in various genres. Spaghetti westerns, comedies, war films, and even giallo. From 1973 through 1977, he would revolutionize the Italian film industry by introducing the Polizio Tesci film a subgenre of gritty, violent, action-filled crime dramas. Castellari had the script ready for high crime, but needed an actor. He wanted Franco Nero and tried to reach out to him via Nero's agent. But the agent kept brushing him off, saying Nero wouldn't be interested. Castellari went around the agents and delivered the script to Nero's hairdresser on a film he was working on. The hairdresser gave Nero the script, and Nero jumped at the chance to work on high crime. This would mark the first of five films the pair would work together, including the upcoming Fourth Horseman, which will have Nero reprise his spaghetti western role of Kioma. When I was a guest on the Wrong Reel podcast, host James Hancock asked me what was it about high crime that stood out to me. Of course, Skype being Skype, he cut out for a bit and I only heard, what was it about? Thus, I gave a long-winded plot summary instead of telling James a relevant answer. Here, I can give that answer that I should have given. What made high crime stand out was that this was the beginning of the Polizio Teshi as we know it. Castellari cited the importation of American films like The French Connection, The Seven Ups, Dirty Harry, Bullet, and wanted to show that Italy was capable of creating their own brand of such films with their own homegrown talent and with minimal use of outside big names like Charles Bronson or Alain Delon. High Crimes show that Italy was able to create similar films to the aforementioned titles. At the box office, it was quite successful. From there, other directors and actors joined in on various productions made in the wake of High Crime. You had the likes of Umberto Lenzi, Alberto De Martino, Tomas Milan, Maurizio Merli, Ruggiero Diodato, Massimo Vanni, and Sal Borghese making names for themselves in the subgenre. This film, in particular, would be the most grounded of Castellari's efforts in the genre. The kills are minimal, which made them more effective and helped maintain a constant sense of tension. There is little action save for the opening car chase and the closing gunfight. 
there is a lot of focus on Belly and his relationships with other characters. Later films by Castellari will put an emphasis on the former elements to continue to draw viewers into the theaters. For that, high crime might be too slow for those who are accustomed to faster-paced Castellari offerings. For the fact that this film has seven people credited in the writing process is amazing, given that the plot is coherent and flows at a decent pace. The ending of the film was in the skillful hands of Vincenzo Tomasi, one of Italy's favorite editors. Remy Julien, one of the greatest stunt drivers and coordinators, with uh, credits including The Italian Job, the original with Michael Caine and GoldenEye, handled the vehicle chase in the beginning. With regards to the behind-the-camera personalities, the most important and long-lasting would be the musical siblings of Maurizio and Guido De Angelis. High Crime marks the first time the brothers collaborated with Castellari. They would work together for another seven films after this one. By 1974, Franco Nero was a bona fide star, thanks to his breakthrough turn as the original Django. Having him as the lead gave High Crime a lot of credibility and moviegoer attention. Performance-wise, Nero stays grounded and doesn't venture into fits of exaggeration as we'll see later on. As far as a Hollywood big name goes for High Crime, you have James Whitmore. He plays the commissioner in a sagely, fatherly way that is endearing and gives the film its heart. Credits include the giant ant classic Them, TV's The Twilight Zone and Rawhide, Tora Tora Tora. He would enjoy a late career renaissance with films like Shawshank Redemption, The Relic, and The Majestic. The French Connection was an influence on high crime, so much so that Castellari brought in Fernando Rey, who played Alain Charnier, the heroine connection for the mafia in The French Connection. He plays another fatherly figure for Belly, serving as an unexpected guide for Nero's character in managing the criminal underworld. The supporting roles and bit parts are filled with noted talent. Enzo's daughter, Stefania, plays Belly's daughter. Nello Pazzafini makes an appearance as a hitman. You know what that means. I'm the best looking man in the Middle Ages. My, my, my. Massimo Vanni plays a killer. Victor Israel has a bit part, but most will immediately recognize him as the zombie priest from Bruno Mattai's Hell of the Living Dead. High Crime is worth checking out because this was the genesis of the Polizio Tesci genre that would sweep through the Italian film industry from the early 70s to around 1980. It may be the least outlandish in the genre, but Nero, the De Angelis brothers, and Castellari's grit will keep you invested. See the people rising. Street Law opens with a montage of various crimes being committed against random bystanders. This was not much of a stretch considering crime rates heightened as the country technologically progressed. The tone is set and establishes a lawlessness as plate Italy, specifically the city of Genoa. Carlo Antonelli, an engineer, is caught in the middle of a bank robbery. When he tries to take back the money that belongs to him, he is abducted by the three bank robbers as they escape. What follows is a tense car chase through the city, featuring an insane motorcycle stunt with the rider going headfirst into a produce shop window. They manage to evade the police pursuit before reaching a shipping yard. Antonelli is brutally beaten to unconsciousness before being abandoned by the robbers. The press and the police surround him as he regains consciousness, everyone seeing him in a position of vulnerability. Antonelli was one of the key figures in the rebellion against the Nazi occupation in Italy. He sees the attack on him as a blow to his pride. He demands action from the police, swift retribution. When the police ignore his expectations for justice, he takes it upon himself to do what he feels is right. He begins with vigilanteism and looks to get back at the robbers. But this comes at the expense of his relationship with his girlfriend, Barbara. With the reluctant help of Tommy, a young criminal, Carlo slowly makes his way through the criminal underworld to find the bank robbers. Even after some harsh beatings and rough encounters with various criminals, he is still determined to find the trio. It leads to a suspenseful climax when Carlo finally comes face to face with the dangerous trio. I happen to catch Street Law not long after seeing the first Death Wish. Death Wish showed to be very much a fantasy film with Charles Bronson turning into a Terminator type Avenger. Street Law brings the action to a realistic level with Nero's character fouling up and nearly getting killed himself on a few occasions. 
If you had a hard time suspending your disbelief or found Death Wish depressing, Street Law may be more to your liking. Unlike Death Wish, Street Law focuses more on the plight of the character with minimal sociopolitical commentary. Before you pass off Street Law as a Death Wish knockoff, consider this. Street Law was released in Italy before Death Wish was distributed overseas. And I'm using a bit of trivia. William Lustig, film director and president of the Blue Underground, was inspired by Street Law for his film Vigilante. Funny enough, when Street Law was distributed in the United Kingdom, it was retitled Vigilante 2. Castellari takes the simple premise of a man seeking vengeance and used it as a reflection of the times. The 1970s were plagued by instances of ideological terrorism and corruption at the highest levels of government. Laws that were thought to protect the citizenry seemed to favor the criminals more. A film like Street Law could be seen as a call to arms for the citizenry to stand up for themselves. Nero took this notion to heart. Maurizio and Guido de Angelis return with possibly some of their best work ever in a film. At the head of this review, you heard a snippet of Driving All Around. It's a song written specifically for the film and manages to set the tone. Undoubtedly, the most memorable track is the sorrowful but rock-heavy track, Goodbye My Friend. The opening is a bit disarming, but then suddenly hits you with a wall of guitar and synth. Franco Nero even mentored the brothers, uh, taking credit for giving them inspiration for the track. Franco Nero in this film cements his status as a reluctant action hero. There are moments where he's actually doing some serious physical activity. According to Castellari, Nero was one of the fastest runners in Italian film. The editing helped create this sentiment, rarely using clips of an obvious stunt double. Nero puts his bright blue eyes to work in various scenes, juggling a sense of ferocity and vulnerability. Giancarlo Preet plays Tommy, the young criminal that assists Carlo. He has a wily charm that brings comedic tension between Nero and him. We previously saw Preet in Confessions of a Police Captain, also starring Nero. <laughs> Preet would later work again with Castellari with the Jaws knockoff The Last Shark and some of the director's post-apocalypse films in the 1980s. Barbara Bach plays Carlo's girlfriend. She doesn't get a whole lot to do before her character leaves the film. She could have been in longer to serve as a moral compass for Carlo. Bach may be best known as her role as Agent Triple X in the James Bond classic, The Spy Who Loved Me. The trio of robbers are played by familiar faces. The ringleader of the group is played by Romano Papo. Joining him are Massimo Vanni and Nazarino Zamperla. We've seen Papo show up from time to time. We'll be seeing more of Vanni in subsequent films in this episode. Same with Renzo Palmer, who plays the police inspector. Zamperla you'll recognize from his turn as an acrobat in the Spencer and Hill spaghetti western Boot Hill. Stefan Zacharias returns, this time in a bit part as Carlo's lawyer. Keep an eye out for Castellari as the denim-wearing shipyard worker. I thoroughly enjoyed Street Law. It was an excellent action drama effort by Castellari, who was finding his stride in the Polizio Tesci genre. Nero is captivating in the lead. You have some of the best music score work by Guido and Mauricio De Angelis. Street Law is easy to find across multiple streaming services, and physical copies are within reasonable prices. Highly, highly recommended. <laughs> The Big Racket centers on Nico Palmieri as he is casing out a gang that is muscling local shopkeepers into giving money for their protection racket. Despite catching them red-handed in many instances, the shopkeeper is either too scared to testify or their defense attorney gets them off the hook, making Palmieri's efforts in vain. The gang become more aggressive when taking out the current mobster, Mazzarelli, that owns the drug rackets. However, one shopkeeper decides to come forward, yet he is found out and his daughter is abducted by the thugs. She is raped and left to be found by her father. This causes the shopkeeper to snap and murder others who try to strong-arm him. Palmieri calls upon a local thief, Pepe, to infiltrate the gang. Pepe's info leads to Palmieri setting up a sting operation, which leads to a shootout in a train yard. Without the intervention of a champion skeet shooter, Palmieri would have been on the losing end. 
The celebration is short-lived when the hoodlums attack the skeet shooter and kill his wife. They also get their revenge on Pepe for ratting them out. Palmieri has no choice but go to desperate measures. He gathers the men who were on the receiving end of the gang's brutality. The shopkeeper, Mazzarelli, Pepe, and the skeet shooter. Palmieri even brings in Doringo, the former leader of the gang who was usurped by Rudy, the man who now leads the gang. This uneasy alliance is armed to the teeth and ready to bring the fight to the gang as well as their mysterious benefactors. The Big Racket represents the peak of the Castellari Palizio Tesci films. Everyone involved with this film is at the top of their game. Great action, interesting characters, top-notch music, explosive violence, all these elements make for an intense film experience. Word of warning, there are some scenes that show violence against women. One is the rape of the shopkeeper's daughter, which happens primarily off-screen. Another scene has the skeet shooter's wife violated, then set on fire. But the violence committed by these women involved a vicious female accomplice, Marcy, played with vicious glee by actress Marcellia Michelangeli. She herself takes her share of blows, including a swift kick in between the legs. That's the one thing I love about Castellari is the cinematic egalitarianism. The women get it bad, but they also give it bad. Another charming element of the Italian Polizio Tesci films is the exotic choice of weaponry. In American films, you can point to the almost ridiculously large guns used by the likes of Dirty Harry Callahan or Paul Kersey. You've got the 357 Magnum and the 475 Wildy Magnum. Meanwhile, in Italian Polizio Tesci, there's the Beretta M12, the FPB submachine gun, the MP40 submachine gun, the British Sten, and even that cornerstone of stylish weaponry, the Thompson. No shortage of eye-catching guns. While Street Law may have had the more memorable music, Guido and Mauricio De Angelis just go insane with the music score here. Instead of going with catchy tunes, they opt for an energetic, frenetic, jazz fusion King Crimson Jam session on caffeine and cocaine binge insanity that needs to be heard to be believed. Hit it, boys. <laughs> Lead man Fabio Testi has the chiseled good looks that are fitting for the film. He is a much needed contrast to the American counterparts like Popeye Doyle, Paul Kersey, and Harry Callahan. Testi started out as a stuntman while still in college. He transitioned into acting, but still did his own stunts when possible. The Big Racket features one of the most mesmerizing sequences caught on film. While scoping out a gang meeting, Palmieri is caught. He is assaulted with his car rolled down a hill. Not content with showing the car rolling down the hill, Castellari has cameras placed on the vehicle and in the passenger seat to show that it's actually Testi performing the stunt. Slow motion is masterfully used to savor the moment, as well as bring a sense of psychedelia to this gritty action film. It's interesting to see Vincent Gardinia in this film, considering he was in the first two Death Wish films. He adds the much-needed levity, coming off as naive, even floaty, but he faces a hard reality check when the gang finds out about his character's betrayal. His brief display of banter and chemistry with Glaco and Arato's Mazzarelli makes me wish they did a buddy film together because they are hilarious. Joshua Sinclair plays the leader of the baddies, Rudy. He may very well be the real-life version of the most interesting man in the world. Some of the accolades and achievements he's accumulated give Dolph Lundgren a run for his money. As a medical doctor, he specialized in tropical diseases. He's a professor of comparative theology. He was a staunch advocate for eliminating apartheid in Africa. All this on top of being a prolific actor, writer, and director. Returning from street law, we have Romano Papo as Doringo, Renzo Palmer as an enraged shopkeeper, and Massimo Vanni as one of the main thugs. Sal Borghese plays Palmieri's partner. Orso Maria Guirino is the skeet shooter. Two of the Delacqua siblings are here, Octaviano as a young man, and Roberto as one of the supporting thugs. Castellari himself cameos as an assaulted restaurateur. The Big Racket represents Castellari at his most liberated. He went all out with this production, which definitely hindered his next offering in the genre of Palazzo Tesci. But, with Big Racket, everything clicked with this film. Street Law was a big step forward, but this was several big steps forward. This is the one to see without a doubt. The 
Heroin Busters, a.k.a. La Via del Droga, opens up with a montage showing the expansive reach of a drug syndicate plaguing Europe, Southeast Asia, and the United States. Interpol agent Mike Hamilton has been tracking the drug ring that has presence in Hong Kong, Cartagena, Amsterdam, New York, and Genoa. The base of operations seems to be Rome. Hamilton knows the only way to disrupt the chain is to send someone in to break it up at the core. Fabio is an undercover cop who is caught at an airport. Once it's revealed he's a narc, Hamilton forms a shaky alliance with him. Fabio goes deep into the drug ring and comes face to face with one of the high ranking members, Gianni. But who is the top head of the organization? With a first hour that features a lot of investigating and plotting interactions, it's not without a few highlights. There is a daring heist that has Fabio and some goons steal drugs right out from underneath the police. There's an amusing foot chase that has Hamilton going after Fabio just to keep the henchmen from guessing they're colluding. Yet it is the first hour that many feel it's slow, which is not an inaccurate statement. The final half hour is one long action sequence, well paced and executed by Castellari. There is an automobile pursuit, followed by a shootout at an abandoned mill, with another shootout at a construction site. Then there is a foot chase that leads to a motorcycle chase, a shootout at a drug manufacturing facility, and then you close with an airplane chase, which is a rarity if I've ever seen. Coming off of the big racket was a perplexing notion. It was Castellari at his best, along with Fabio Testi in the lead role. Since the previous Poligio Tesci effort pushed the genre to the limit, Castellari took the next film down a few notches, saving the major action sequences for the latter third while teasing in the first two thirds. Because of this, many feel the film has a drag to it. The Heroin Busters marks one of the few non horror scores by Goblin along with Squadra Anti-Gangster and Nocturne being other examples. Distancing themselves from their jazz fusion prog rock sound, their funk rock approach makes for one of the most underrated scores in their catalog. The main theme for the Heroin Busters ranks as some of their best. As much as I love Goblin, they lack the punch of Mauricio and Guido de Angelis, but that may be due to the tensions within the band at the time they were recording for this film. While Testi may be a co-lead with David Hemmings, this is primarily Testi's film. He has his share of badass moments. Notably, he uses a dead henchman's body to get a gun several feet out of his reach. He performs a cool stunt of sliding down an escalator railing, pulling off a nonchalant shot that kills another henchman. David Hemmings gives a turn that is amped up, which is a nice contrast to Testy's cool mannerisms. He has a determination that comes off as comical at times, but works for the film. Hemmings would still find steady work in the decades that followed, but enjoyed a renaissance in the 2000s with Gladiator, Spy Game, Me Machine, Gangs of New York, and The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. A lot of returning faces. Romano Papo, Massimo Vanni, Joshua Sinclair, Roberto and Octaviano Atelacqua. Castellari cameos as a drug connection in Amsterdam. The film feels like a cast reunion as Castellari seemed to know he did all he could for this genre. And this was his final film ever in Palizio Tesci. And that finishes this look at the Palizio Tesci films of Enzo G. Castellari. As a group, these are four solid films. But if you're picky, then Street Law and The Big Racket are the must-sees of the four. You will not regret seeing these amazing pieces of action cinema. Until next time, this is Mackenzie Lambert for Megan the Movies. Take care, everyone. <laughs>